Top story this morning, negotiators from China and the U.S. are reportedly set to resume talks as soon as next week. U.S. futures jumping on the news up 263 points uh, again this morning. A solid uh, gain yesterday uh, as well. And we've got the S&P indicated up 27. And the Nasdaq up 95. Joining us now to talk the state of the global economy and emerging markets is Mark Mobius, founding partner at Mobius Capital Partners. And you've been on a couple of times, Mark, recently on, on different shows and different places I've seen you. But I'm hearkening back to some comments I saw you make about um, just where global yields are in the global bond market is. And you were making these comments at the same time that it was, I guess we had just inverted and the recession talk was running fast and furious at that point. And we were looking for, you know, looking into the abyss and, and really looking to see what's going on that, that, that is causing so much uh, angst and, and trepidation. And, and you just were simply saying, I think this, the equity markets globally are gonna do well because interest rates are so low. And it was like, wow, that almost seems too simple. Do you still feel that way? <laughs> yeah. I still do. I, in fact, I feel more strongly about it now because people are talking about uh, treasuries going to zero interest rates. So, I mean, if that's the case, where do you hide? Uh, and what I think is that people are going to start looking for yield, uh, companies that have dividends that pay a yield. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing they're going to look for, for safety, given what's happening between the U.S. and China, they're going to be looking for gold. So I think those are the two places where you have to hide, so to speak, from the current uh, situation. Okay. Let me just tell you wh how, how I would worry about that. The, the zero interest rates are forecasting some type of global slowdown. So all the big yield stocks, their businesses are going to go in the tank. They're not going to be able to cover the dividend. Uh, and, and whatever you made in yield, you're going to lose in principle when the stocks go down to recession lows. So that, that doesn't make sense. Why won't that happen? No, that's right. I think most of the stocks will be in the scenario that you just described. But there will be stocks that will continue to make money. I'm not saying that growth is going to be huge, but they'll continue to struggle along and pay dividends. There won't be many, but there will be these stocks that you've got to identify, which is what we're doing now. We're looking very closely at which companies can survive uh, this kind of global slowdown. And by the way, I don't think it'll be uh, universally sl global slowdown. I think some companies will continue to do well and some countries will continue to do well. And those are the ones you've got to identify. That's why it's kind of a free-for-all now. We're looking everywhere where we can find these kinds of companies. It's not going to be easy. We, uh, and this, anything we're doing is in, with the backdrop of uh, the trade tensions with China and, and really around the, uh, the other countries as well for the United States. But You've done a lot of, of traveling to China, a lot of business there. Do, do you, the latest news today, the, the back to the negotiating table, do you think that there is ground to be given on both sides of this? Will China give some ground? Will we give some ground? Will we come to something that's mutually beneficial at some point? I don't think anything will happen anytime soon because you've got a number of factors at play here. Don't forget Hong Kong. Hong Kong is very, very important. And you can see that some of the congressmen in Washington are really concerned about what's happening in Hong Kong. If this gets worse and for some reason the Chinese move into Hong Kong, then you could see the U.S. breaking the tie with Hong Kong, which sounds like an uh, enormous gamble, but this could happen. And that means that you have a, one big market uh, going into the doldrums. So I think we have to watch that situation very carefully, very complex, but it's uh, very, very important to understand the strategic uh, battle that's taking place between the U.S. and China. Mark, I'm sorry, can you, can you just go back and, and say that again? You could see the U.S. breaking ranks with Hong Kong, meaning, meaning what? We would say, never mind Hong Kong, well, forget about I, it because well, we're more concerned about a yeah. trade? Uh, no, because what happened, you must remember that the U.S., uh, has an act which uh, gives Hong Kong certain uh, trade and uh, investment uh, benefits. If the U.S. Congress decides, and by the way, that act is dependent upon Hong Kong being independent 
and not governed by China. Uh, if that is broken, then the Congress might re pull back on that act, uh, which could be very, very significant in terms of what happens to Hong Kong. So, so uh, the whole uh, picture of China-U.S. relations is tied up not only with trade, not only with uh, intellectual property, property theft and all the rest of that, but also with Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is sort of the epitome of what the U.S. wants China to be. Uh, and if uh, they move in another direction, then uh, a lot of congressmen in the U.S. will be quite unhappy. So we have to watch that very carefully. Mark, why would uh, the bond market and, and gold be positively correlated? Is it, is it usually sort of the opposite? It, it, you know, you're looking for inflation or, or I don't know, I, I guess fiat currencies are, are somewhat questionable, but it's not implicit that you would think that zero interest rates would cause you to buy something with no yield. Well, the situation now is that uh, with the interest rates going down to close to zero or even minus, then where do you put your money? Right. Particularly if you are very afraid of the uh, economic, political environment globally. So you rush into gold. Okay. The other fact, of course, is money supply. What is the money supply globally? Who knows? Nobody knows what it really is. Simply because you have the cryptocurrencies, you have all these countries printing like crazy in order to bring those interest rates down. So I believe a lot of people are going to think, hey, wait a minute, I'm not getting anything in the bank anyway, so why don't I go into gold as a safe haven and then look for stocks that are paying some good yield or at least some reasonable yield? You, and I think that's the direction that we're heading. Mark, do you think that there are cryptocurrencies that have inherent value, uh, like digital gold? Do you think Bitcoin, for example, has uh, inherent value? If there's a cryptocurrency that is really backed by gold, and that is uh, there is a meaningful agreement and uh, uh, some kind of monitoring of this connection, uh, then this could be quite interesting. That it would be, be a global uh, currency. That, that's but not I don't what, see any yeah, of them that, yet. That would be a no then, is what you're telling me, because there, there are people that think that, that <laughs> yeah. blockchain right. itself uh, imbues the... Uh, the asset with inherent value, which is which is that why they, they call it digital gold. But I mean, we, we seem to be okay with a lot of fiat currencies that aren't backed by gold. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's the full faith and credit of the government, but nothing's backed by gold anymore except ETFs. Or I don't know. I, I mean, why 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 would that's right? If, that, if you needed something backed yeah. by gold, why would yeah. you have any faith in any fiat currency then? <laughs> No, the bottom line is that there's a whole generation of people who have faith in the Internet. They have faith in these cryptocurrencies. That's yeah, all it right. takes. Uh, the reason why people believe in the U.S. dollar is because they have faith right. that with dollars in their hands they can buy something. So the degree to which a cryptocurrency can enable you to buy something and you believe that to be the case, then it's, it's fine. But I think people are going to begin to realize that these are very, very risky situations. And by the way, I believe blockchain is a very high risk a situation. You know, a lot of people say, oh, blockchain can't be uh, uh, broken into. No, it can be. Anything that's created by man can be broken into, and it could create a big crisis. So I think we have to be very careful with blockchain. And Mark, very quickly, just you said look for stocks that you think have a reasonable dividend. What's a reasonable dividend? You got any of those names that you throw out? Well, nowadays, I would say, you know, if we can get 2 3% yield, that's great. Uh, there are a number of stocks that do better than that, but uh, uh, that would be a reasonable yield uh, to have. Thank you for your time. It is great to see you. When we return, Slack posting some mixed results yesterday. That stock dropping after the company's first public report. We'll talk to two analysts next about where it goes from here, including one major bear on the stock. And later, we have the CEO himself, Stuart Butterfield. His first interview since the direct listing back in June. You don't want to miss it.
car buying from findandrunmycar.com is the place where you can find quality used cars from trusted dealers rated by you and where you can fund your car with finance to fit your budget. It's feel good car buying all in one place. At Tesco, we can pop our pasta in your Astra, our Red Lester in your Fiesta, or our Mayo in your Mondeo. All you need to do is try click and collect. Just go to tesco.com, order your shopping, then click and collect. With the minimum basket spend now only £25. And if you fancy something a little more exotic, we can even put our pad tie in your cash kai. Try click and collect at tesco.com. Every little helps. Selected larger stores, booking charge may apply. See online for full terms and conditions. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And they'd have chained the back wheel. Would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. Strength and things. Strength and things. Strength and things. Strength and things. Strength and things and strings. of strings and things called strings and things including cheese strings yollies and new cheese shapes find them all in the cheese and yogurt aisle strings and things i didn't choose you you chose me when you broke from the crowd and pawed at my knee soon you'll be feeling right at home you'll be a bit unsure but you're free to roam what's good to chew what's nice to nibble wet food dry food tin food kibble you might sometimes be cheeky not always wise but i know i found love in those puppy dog eyes Join the free VIP Puppy Club from Pets at Home for advice and exclusive offers, including 10% off your first shop in store. Visit petsathome.com forward slash puppy club or join in store. T's and C's apply. Make sure you're uni ready with our huge range of practical essentials and home from home comforts and get 10% off for a limited time. T's and C's and exclusions apply. Dunelm, the home of homes. First world problem number 346. Well, you know, people might think I'm exaggerating, but since Virgin Atlantic announced their sale, I can't sleep. One minute my head is in New York, the next I'm searching for shows in Vegas. I can't stop. So many choices. South Africa, the Caribbean, California. My search history is a total mess. Oh, I might need to bring it up with my life coach. Seriously? Get a flight. Bing bong. The Virgin Atlantic sale is now on. Visit virginatlantic.com and fly direct from London. Welcome back, everybody. Slack briefly broke below its $26 listing price in after hours trading after the company posted weak bottom line guidance. Joining us right now to talk about the company's first report as a public company is Rishi Jaluria. He is senior vice president and senior research analyst at DA Davidson. Also, Dan Romanoff, who's an analyst at Morningstar. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Um, Rishi, I, I know that you had been neutral on the stock kind of before any of this happened. What do you think after hearing the comments last night? Yeah, um, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, look, I'm, I'm still neutral on the stock, but it's primarily valuation-based. I actually thought uh, the results were pretty solid. There was a lot to like out of it. Uh, we, we saw you know, growing momentum with uh, large customers. I think uh, you know, we can talk about the revenue deceleration, but once you adjust for some one-time factors, uh, it, it really wasn't that much of a deceleration at all. Uh, and, and we're starting to see kind of early evidence of traction outside of technology and technology forward companies, which had always been a little bit of a concern of mine that this was a little bit more of a niche market, but clearly it's expanding to, you know, companies that you would not assume would actually become Slack customers. Um, so I think all the, all the metrics are pointing in the right direction. And, and I think, you know, I would, I would say this is probably a little bit of an overreaction. <laughs> if we thought the stock was fairly priced before, then there's no reason it should be trading down this morning. All right, Dan, you are more bearish in the situation. You've got a price target of just $14 for the stock, which is last trading about 2675 um, Maybe the, some of the biggest surprise is that the company didn't beat the expectations that it set when it was first launching as an IPO. Um, what did you think about that? Yeah, I just think it's a little difficult when you're newly listed to come out of the gate and maybe you know disappoint investors a little bit. If you're not sort of beating and raising in a clean manner, I think uh, investors are going to have a tough time with that, especially when you're one of the most highly um, you know hyped up 
uh, IPOs or direct listings in this case, uh, you know, in the last few years. So I just think that's a tough setup for them. It's a tough setup, but maybe it just means they're not used to the silly game that companies play of setting the bar too low so they can step over it. Yeah, I think you saw a couple of signs of that on the call, actually. Uh, CEO stumbled a little bit when asked about the service outages. So, uh, you know, I think they're I think they're doing a fine job. I think it's more of a learning exercise for them. And, uh, you know, I think that they'll turn it around and address the little issues that they had. Rishi, I think the bigger question probably is what Microsoft is doing. They're the biggest competitor. Um, they've put out some numbers showing that they've got strong pickup, and maybe that's a bigger competitor to Slack than people had anticipated. What, what do you think from that perspective? What would you like to hear from Slack to clear up any questions on that? Yeah, and, and look, I mean, I, I think my, my take on it is Microsoft's put out some numbers that sound really impressive, but let's take a step back and remember the fact that Microsoft Teams is a product that's being given away for free with uh, Office 365, right? You get the cheapest version of it, you get Teams for free, and what they've actually started doing is having it start anytime you boot up your computer, Microsoft Teams loads. So when they put out that 13 million daily active users and you say, wow, that's right. bigger than Slack's 10 million. So you don't think people are actually using it? I don't think that's active, right? And so I think the more important metric is the engagement metric, right? Slack, you see more than an hour and a half of active usage on Slack every workday. I would be very, very shocked if Microsoft Teams comes even close to that. And that, to me, is much more important that where, where Slack has a huge advantage ahead of Teams. What do you think Slack's ultimately worth? I, I think the big question that, that behind that is the traction outside of tech. If we can see more of these big deployments like what we saw at the uh, Fortune 100 financial services firm that they talked about on the call yesterday, uh, then I think this has potential to be the next billion dollar plus or multi-billion dollar SaaS company. And then I think the stock is worth a lot more than it is today. But that is a big if, right? Mm -hmm. There's only been five billion dollar SaaS, five one billion dollar SaaS plus SaaS companies in history. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dan, you are, are not as bearish sounding when you're talking as your $14 price target is. You, you think that this company is in a position to really make something of itself? You think it's, uh, just explain, $14 price target and what didn't sound like a truly pessimistic take on the company? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a fair assessment. I think uh, we at Morningstar, we call that a fair value estimate. <clears throat> and the problem that we run into is, uh, is we're, we're an ROIC model, so... You know, I'm looking at um, what we're calling an economic moat, and this is a newly listed company, so I, I'm not sure that there's a giant moat here yet. There are definitely signs of some positive momentum. There's obviously very strong adoption. Uh, the metrics, while decelerating, I think were generally good. The results themselves were good. So to say that uh, I'm bearish is, is maybe a little misleading. I think I was probably among the higher uh, estimates for the quarter, which hmm. we don't emphasize so much. So, And, and they be even my estimate. So it was a good quarter by them. Uh, I would say, though, that we do have a little concern that, yeah, Microsoft is giving teams away for free, uh, and that's tough sledding. So, for example, last night when the CEO was saying we're not uh, as concerned about monetizing and converting our uh, free users right. to paid users, uh, I, I think that is just a little stumble. I think investors don't necessarily want to hear that. And if you're concerned about your 500,000 free users, well, you know, Microsoft is on uh, you know, 250 million desktops. So right. that, that's a pretty big funnel that you're going to have to overcome. Dan, Rishi, I want to thank you both for your time. By the way, folks, don't miss our interview later in the show with Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield. That's coming up at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Okay, a lot more to come on Squawk Box this morning. Presidential candidate Tom Steyer is going to join us later in the show. He's going to tell us how he's planning to run against President Trump's economic record. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. But first, our guest host for the next hour, former House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, on his way to the set. Two big hours ahead, right here on Squawk Box in the morning. Dear Brian and Liz, my favorite part about being an insurance agent... At Tesco, we can pop our pasta in your Astra, our Red Leicester in your Fiesta, or our Mayo in your Mondeo. All you need to do is try Click and Collect. Just go to Tesco.com, order your shopping, then click and collect. With the minimum basket spend now only £25. And if you fancy something a little more exotic, we can even put our pad thai in your cash kai. Try Click and Collect at Tesco.com. Every little helps. Selected larger stores. Booking charge may apply. See online for full terms and conditions. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And then they'd have chained the back wheel. It would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. 
So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. I'm getting strawberry notes. And a flutter of sweetness. Without adding sugar. Clever. It is. Yes, UK uses a lactose-reduced milk that enhances flavour without adding sugar or artificial sweeteners. Mmm, milky deliciousness. And packed full of goodness. Very clever. Strawberry Yazoo Kids supports change for life. Yazoo, shake it up! Contains naturally occurring sugars. Milk is a source of calcium, which is needed for the maintenance of normal bones. Did someone say winter sun? It's that time again. And this year at Jet2 Holidays, we're saying Cyprus. On this incredible island, you get it all. A choice of four- and five-star hotels, amazing ancient ruins for culture-packed days out, hiking and cycling trails for active adventures, and plenty of blue flag beaches for soaking up that winter sun. Book Cyprus now with just a £60 deposit. Jet2 Holidays. Package holidays you can trust. Apronetal protected. Subject to availability and conditions. At the bank of Antandek, they're looking for a mascot. We need an icon. Something that says high fly into all our mortgage customers. Like a falcon or a stallion. Or even better, a parrot. Check it out. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Santander, they're concentrating on helping customers find ways to take years off their mortgage with their overpayment calculator. See what's possible at Santander. All applications are subject to status and our lending criteria. Your home may be repossessed if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage. Again, top U.S. and Chinese officials set to meet in coming weeks to try and hammer out a trade deal. The news, sending stock futures higher, will discuss with guest hosts and former House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Tech under fire. Attorneys general across the country probing Google for antitrust violations. What it means for the company and the tech industry is straight ahead. Plus, trimming the fat at Goldman Sachs. A new report saying the bank is culling its upper ranks. We're going to tell you why as the second hour of Squawk Box begins right now. Live from the beating heart of business, New York. This is Squat Box. Good morning and welcome back to Squat Box here on CNBC. I'm Joe Kernan along with Becky Quick and Andrew Ross Sorkin. In studio, Eric Kanner, former congressman from Virginia. Uh, he's currently vice chair and managing director uh, at Mollis and Company. You were, you were a majority leader. <laughs> Weren't you? Long time ago. There was a majority back then. <laughs> right. Oh, there not, is now, too. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's there is now, party. too. Just the... Uh, just a different kind of majority. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nice work. With a nice, ni- nice work with your uh, majority... Li- no. Um, <laughs> uh, what, 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 what can you say? Uh, it, these are interesting times. You know there's an election coming up again. Certainly are. Interesting times. I was spent the last few days in London talking about interesting, talking about majorities that come and go. That was uh, something to behold. Them. You think this majority is going to come and go too? <laughs> uh, the uh, in 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 uh, oh, Washington or in, no? In in in, in what's going on with Boris Johnson in well, London? Well, how was how's that honeymoon right going? Right. How, yeah. how long was Trump's? How long was Trump's honeymoon? Right, there was no such thing. There was a negative. It was like negative interest rates. Right. <laughs> his negative the de- the night of the election, his negative honeymoon started before he got there. Before he was even was before the the right. votes were actually in. Uh, but Bojo, uh, no, no, I no. thought he had. Done a lot of power. I thought he had support. I thought he's, he looks like was, he's got the same same fate as Theresa May so far, right? Or, or as Joe Biden would say, uh, Margaret Thatcher. It'll, it'll it'll get it'll come to an election, right? And I think uh, in in that country they've got a lot to sort out. They don't have a constitution. It all comes down to that. I said that yesterday that we we are willing to to license out our constitution, aren't we, for a fee? <laughs> why doesn't everyone you use our? It. Yeah. Why doesn't everyone use our? It, it, I mean, you can get it on Microsoft Docs or something, Andrew. Right? Send it right up. Send it to Italy for starters. I mean, come on. So uh, anyway, uh, what happened? I was going to do the futures. There they are, two hundred sixty points. Uh, the S and P up twenty seven. Nasdaq up. Uh, 90. What, Andrew, are there What's headlines? Are there we things? have some headlines. Okay. I'm going to bring you the headlines as we speak uh, right now. Let's like nobody else can do this it. Hour, like nobody else can do it. Uh, some key economic reports coming out uh, this morning as investors try to figure out 
Uh, what the Fed is going to do next, of course, in just over an hour, we're going to get the August ADP report. Then that's expected, we should say, to show that the U.S. economy added 140,000 jobs last month. Shortly after that, we'll get reports on jobless claims and productivity. And then we should tell you that shares this morning of Slack are under a lot of pressure. The workplace messaging company did report a smaller than expected loss for the second quarter, but its projected loss for the current quarter is larger than Wall Street had been anticipating. The company CEO is going to join us live at 8 a.m. this morning with Stuart Butterfield, so you don't want to miss that. And then a headline that uh, moved just moments ago probably caused a few double takes. It said, Brexit, Johnson resigns. But it was not British Prime Minister Boris Johnson who resigned. It was his brother, member of uh, Parliament, uh, Joe Johnson. He's stepping down as junior minister and from Parliament as well. He says he is torn between family loyalty and the national interest. Pretty interesting, How about right? That for a brother? Right. Joe Johnson <laughs> yeah. has been in favor of a second referendum on Britain's exit from the EU. So I don't know what happens at the family dinner table <laughs> yeah. uh, in that family at the moment. The United States and China have agreed to return to the negotiating table in Washington, but this time face to face. Eamon Jammers joins us with more. And Eamon, this is the reason we're looking at the futures up by over 250 points this morning. What, what, what really happened and how do you read the tea leaves? Yeah, good morning, Becky. So what you need to do here is pay attention to the nuance between these two statements that we got last night from Beijing and Washington. Slightly different statements from both sides. First, the Chinese side, that came in around 10 o'clock last night, uh, East Coast time. They confirmed that there was a phone call between trade negotiators on the U.S. and Chinese sides, and they said that officials have agreed to hold the next round of talks in Washington in early October, uh, and the Chinese said that the two sides agreed to work together and take, quote, practical actions. But now look at the U.S. statement. This coming from the USTR spokesman uh, to me late last night saying Ambassador Lighthizer and Secretary Mnuchin spoke with Vice Premier Liu He of China on Wednesday night regarding U.S.-China trade talks. They agreed to hold meetings at the ministerial level in Washington in the coming weeks. In advance of those discussions, deputy-level meetings will take place in mid-September to lay the groundwork for meaningful progress. So the nuance there, Becky, is uh, that the U.S. side is not committing to that month of October time frame, and they're saying there are going to be two tiers of meetings, deputy-level meetings first, and then if those, quote, lay the groundwork for meaningful progress, then you get to the ministerial level, which means these folks, Stephen Mnuchin, Robert Lighthizer, and Liu He, uh, would be meeting face-to-face -face, uh, to hammer out any deal. But the question is, what's the threshold to get to that ministerial-level talks, and when will those talks be? We don't know the answer to that specifically, and maybe all sides are leaving it sort of deliberately vague here so they can uh, decide whether they feel like they've got enough progress to move forward to those talks or not. So a tiered approach from the U.S. side, Becky. Eamon, that, that makes sense when you consider what happened the last time around when Mnuchin and Lighthizer uh, traveled to China and very quickly found out that there wasn't much reason to be in the room, that nobody had budged on anything. So I, I guess this right. is fool me once, uh, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Right. And then there's, of course, the third tier, which is the principles themselves, right? I mean, at some right. point, in order to finish this, you've got to get the leaders of China and the United States into a room together to hammer out something and sign it. So we're a long way away from that, but I think the market saw this overnight as a positive. Just the fact that the formal talks are ongoing, there are meetings, there's progress, there's discussion, all that seems to be encouraging to the market, even if we don't know exactly uh, where all this is headed at this point. Eamon, thank you. Great to see you. You bet. See you. All right. For, for more uh, on U.S.-China trade tensions, let's get to our guest host, Eric Cantor, and Michael Zizas. He is a public policy strategist at Morgan Stanley. Uh, let me just start with, with, you, with you, Eric. In terms of the, uh, the backdrop, uh, in terms of the business at, at Molus, uh, with the, the overhang of of the trade wars, what, what, what are you seeing? You know, listen, I, I know there's just a lot of talk and market sentiment out there with the volatility that's being caused by, uh, you know, the trade talks collapse and then restart and start. But I'll tell you that in, in our business, um, you know, we, we, are, we do see that there is maybe an elongation of time that it takes from deal announcement to closure on the larger cap uh, deals. But... You know, we play very heavy in the mid-cap market, um, sponsor-related activity. And right now, the things that have been in place uh, for M&A uh, in that arena are still in place. Right. I mean, I mean, you, you think about it. Uh, right now, you've got technology driving disruption. And you've got now boards thinking about, are their companies well-positioned? You've got a situation in the sponsor community where 
maybe before there was so many private equity and alternative managers, you know, you had family businesses that may have sold every 30 or 40 years. You now have got timetables at three to five years where these businesses are turning over. You add on to that the access and availability of capital. Um, and uh, we also see actually the, the issue of activism. You know, M&A has become a big component when it comes to activism. So, I, you know, listen, the year started out probably slower than we would have liked, um, but uh, really are seeing an uptick in activity now and, and hoping for a very strong so you don't think the volatile half. market typically, if you look at a volatile market, it's bad for, it's bad for M&A. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, it, it just depends on, on where you are we're looking. But I think that such a key driver to this, and, and the large cap is not as rate sensitive. I mean, we know that. But again, the, in the mid-market, the strength is about the availability and access to capital. It's about this constant churn, if you will. You mean the private equity, this, this, the game of hot potato that's being played in the private equity business right, right. now? I mean, listen, you, you've got to think about it. Like I said before, this used, these used to be family businesses that right. were built up over decades. And now, you know, these are businesses that are that are uh, bought and sold. They are made more efficient. They, they produce more to the bottom line. Uh, so right now, we feel, uh, and our activity is uh, indicating there's still a lot of confidence around the mid-market uh, while you've got these macro trade issues that are distracting the public equity. All right, Michael, specifically with the China deal, your comments are that, you know, when time passes, maybe there's some opportunity for, for something to happen, but I'm not sure you see any real change since that blow up in, in late April at this point. Is, is there any yeah. reason for optimism that, that we're further along? Yeah, well, I think that's fair. So with the headline overnight, for example, I think that's relatively low quality information because what we've seen since May 5th, which is when the deal really broke down along some really meaningful key issues, is that there have been plenty of talks, but there's also been plenty of escalation. So it's impossible for us to know exactly what's being talked about, but the pattern of evidence is that both sides are talking, but both sides are escalating, which would suggest that the key issues of when the tariffs come off, how to enforce um, intellectual property protections, um, how much China's economy should open up and over what time frame, that there hasn't been any meaningful progress there. I think what we'd want to see in order to kind of take the type of headline that we got overnight and think that's a high quality piece of information that makes you more bullish is some type of credible report that there's progress made on those issues, or at least some of their action that would tell you that that's happening behind the scenes. Who's going to want to make a deal more? Uh, I, th I think it really depends on how this plays out. So, for example, uh, in our view, we think the framework right now is that both sides kind of see the payoffs to escalating as much greater than cooperating, and that's why we think this is going to escalate to the point where all the announced tariffs that we have so far are going to go on. Until the, pay the payoffs change, if, for example, uh, the economy shows material weakness, financial markets Who's sell economy? off. Who's economy? Well, but, you mean, it, it that's what I mean. Sides, so right? wh which one, in your view, which economy is going to take it on the chin? Well, they both are. They both are, right? Equally? I mean, China's... No, no, in the, so there's sort of a short term and the long term. In the short term, because China, because the U.S. has a trade deficit with China, there's sort of more acute pain there first, and it's already been felt okay. um, in great deal. It sort of takes time to travel the U.S., and you know, I think what the conduit for that is corporate confidence lower, CapEx lower, eventually travel. I know I'm good looking, but market. Michael's talking is, uh, there you are. No. Oh boy, I think honestly <laughs> someone fell asleep in the in the control room. Maybe. But I, yeah. You know, you talk about the payoff, though. I think that that calculus may change as we round the corner to the election. I mean, it really is. I um, mean, that's where I think, you know, it, at some point now we've got a. A stronger economy than most because of our consumer. But at some point, are we robust enough to be able to handle the acceleration that you talk about? That's my question. Yeah. If, we, if we just kept and steady where we are, maybe we can handle this. The question is, are the consumers going to start to react negatively if that acceleration occurs? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a function of the labor market. So the, the, we've seen in the data that corporate confidence is starting to come down, CapEx is starting to come down. We've started to see growth in labor hours work start to come down. We haven't actually seen layoffs yet. I mean, that's the obvious trigger to how the consumer then would have behaved differently. Uh, our economist view, we're kind of really close to the precipice here. 
a couple more escalations, I think that puts us clearly into global growth recession territory and really starts flirting with U.S. recession territory for 2020. All right, thank you, Michael. Eric, uh, you'll be with us for the rest of the hour. I want to I want to see where you stand because you know you're a big time you know Wall Streeter now. So now you got a horse in the game for business. So you probably. You that, know, was, that was part of my then, issue. I always had a horse in the game. But then you, when you were a Republican, <laughs> you were a classic Republican who hates tariffs uh, and, and loves free trade. So you got a lot of reasons to not like what's going on. I just, yeah. I just wonder if you think it's, it's something that needed to be done. or Are, are you patient with, with what President Trump is trying to do? Or, or do you think we need to get out of this? It was ill-conceived and we need to get out as soon as possible. What, what, just in a nutshell, what do you think? You know, I, I have, I've, I've said before right in this table that we, we should be taking on China and he deserves credit for stepping that fight. I hear up. a butt coming. In, There's a comma, but, comma, yeah, comma, but, comma but, yeah, yeah. But I don't think um, all the other trade uh, spats that are attractive to someone and people at the White House. Canada, Mexico, Europe. Right. Let's get the USMCA done. I mean, I think, you know, speaking to Michael and, and the issue of acceleration on the trade right. front with China, if at least you go and put that USMCA to bed and say, hey. Well, it's not the administration holding that up right now. Right. But the administration could go in and say, you know, look, and I know White Houses from what I know, is doing a good job, and, and Pelosi apparently is dealing with him straight up on trying to get this done. It's really not possible to hear a butt coming. I don't think it. They were very immature. You can see, uh, you can see one coming. It depends. Uh, but it's impossible, really, to hear one coming, isn't it? I mean, coming up, when we return, it's tech very immature. Fire. I don't Google, know. the new target for over 30 attorneys generals for the company's behavior and potential antitrust violations. We're going to discuss that and so much more after the break. I guess it might this CNBC program is sponsored by Geico. I can find a fun my car. From a mini to a Jaguar. Feel good car buying from findandfundmycar.com is the place where you can find quality used cars from trusted dealers rated by you and where you can fund your car with finance to fit your budget. It's feel good car buying all in one place. At Romans, you can rent your next home from just £36, plus your first month's rent. No deposit, no problem. Romans, your trusted local property experts at romans.co.uk. Conditions and monthly fee apply. At Tesco, we can pop our pasta in your Astra, our Red Leicester in your Fiesta, or our Mayo in your Mondeo. All you need to do is try, click, and collect. Just go to tesco.com, order your shopping, then click and collect. With the minimum basket spend now only £25. And if you fancy something a little more exotic, we can even put our pad tie in your cash kai. Try, click, and collect at tesco.com. Every little helps. Selected larger stores, booking charge may apply. See online for full terms and conditions. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And they'd have chained the bat wheel. It would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. Did someone say winter sun? It's that time again. And this year at Jet2 Holidays, we're saying Cyprus. On this incredible island, you get it all. A choice of four and five star hotels, amazing ancient ruins for culture packed days out, hiking and cycling trails for active adventures, and plenty of blue flag beaches for soaking up that winter sun. Book Cyprus now with just a £60 deposit. Jet2 Holidays. Package holidays you can trust. Apronet or protected, subject to availability and conditions. Google is the latest tech giant to come under fire. The company is facing concerns about antitrust, privacy, and bias. Let's bring in Tony Rahm. He is technology policy reporter for The Washington Post. He's written two pieces about Google just this week, one about YouTube's $170 million child privacy settlement with the Federal Trade Commission, and the other about antitrust concerns among over 30 attorneys general with different states. Uh, Tony, thanks for being here. It's great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's talk first about the, the settlement with the FTC. That's a big deal because it went directly at uh, YouTube, 
and the relationship with advertisers. What, what, what happened? Yeah, the Federal Trade Commission finally acted on years of complaints that YouTube was improperly collecting data about children under age 13. Remember, under federal law, uh, kids under age 13 have special protections. You have to get parental permission before you collect their data for the purpose of things like serving them targeted ads. And what the feds contended was that YouTube was fully aware that children were using its platform and used that fact as a way to entice advertisers and entice brands, but didn't check the right boxes with respect to kids' privacy. Privacy law. So we saw a $170 million fine and some other penalties there. Will that change the way they're doing business, the way they're uh, reaching out to, 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 to kids, the way they are dealing with advertisers at this point? And is that anything that you think would potentially hurt their bottom line down the road? Or is this a one-time deal? You pay the fine and you move on. Yeah, well, the hope is that it'll change their business because YouTube and Google shouldn't be collecting this information. I, I mean, change their business in a way that hurts their bottom line. Right. I, I think the fine sort of speaks to that. It's not like Google's stock price suffered from a $170 million hit. That's like, what, two days worth of revenue for a company right. like Google. So the fine alone wasn't a whole lot. But it will be interesting to see what this means for Google, uh, given the fact that so many toy brands and television shows and whatnot use YouTube to reach younger audiences. And targeted ads are much more lucrative than some of the more contextual ads that the feds would like to see Google serve alongside children's content. The state attorneys general, that's a, that's a different situation because these are 30 state attorneys general, uh, bipartisan, both sides of the aisle, who sound like they are coming together to really target uh, not only Google, but many other big technology companies, too. They don't like what they see in terms of a monopoly, and they don't like uh, what they perceive to be as bias. What, what is this going to mean? What's happening behind the scenes? Yeah, right. The states are very concerned about competition in the big tech space. And it's not just states, by the way. The feds are doing the same. But we're expecting to see an announcement from more than 30 AGs. And we're talking about Democrats and Republicans alike targeting big tech with antitrust concerns and opening a specific civic investigation into Google. And so what this means for the company in the long term remains to be seen. But when you have both the states and the feds and bipartisan interest in antitrust and an investigation into a company, it doesn't necessarily mean a good thing. So I think the challenges are just beginning for Google here in this space. Eric Cantor is our guest host today. He's the former majority leader in the House of Representatives. And Eric, we, we talk about how nothing seems to ever be able to be gotten done in Washington. Is this a different situation because you have have an issue that it seems to me is bipartisan. Yeah, you know, I, I think there are, this is an issue that's bipartisan. There are different incentives for either side to sure. sort of go after t uh, big tech. You know, on the, on the one hand, um, <clears throat> it is on, on the Democratic side. The motivation is they believe that te big tech allowed the Russians to come in and mess with the election. And then on, on my side of the aisle, you know, there is a lot of allegation that there is some type of um, uh, curating, if you will, or, or excluding conservative voices. So, again, that, that's, those are, that's, that's enough of, of a nuance there that maybe the two sides don't come together. But then you have I issues think, like privacy. And this is my point. Those two issues, I, don't, I think, are mismatched. But mm -hmm. there are issues of privacy. But I keep coming back to the point on the privacy fact is that most people will go click through the I accept, even if you now are getting the uh, European regulatory uh, face on your apps if you travel abroad, people just click away and say, fine, go take whatever information you've got. They don't quite sort of think that the trade-off is a bad thing for them because people get access to a search engine or an app. I think we've it's not... FOMO, right? We, right? It's fear of missing out. We've not quite gotten to the point where people say, hey, I want to own my data. And I think at the point where you can monetize your data personally mm -hmm. is the point at which maybe you can see some balance reintroduced into this equation. Tony, what, what should we watch for next week with the state attorneys general? What, what's the next shoe that you think is waiting to drop? Right. I think the first thing is going to be to watch exactly what the states point their fire at first. Because as, you know, Eric Cantor and others have pointed out here, there are a lot of issues, whether it's bias, whether it's privacy, and some of them aren't explicitly antitrust, but the states do have a lot of power in areas like consumer protection to go very big on a company like Google. And I think second the thing to watch is going to be the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission, which have opened their own broad reviews of big tech. It'll be interesting to see if they partner with the state or if they go out alone, and how that evolves in the coming months. Tony, that's what I just wanted to ask you really quickly, because you have, some, you, have a, you have AGs, all of whom have different motivations in different states. Some are completely political, in which they just want 
to be able to say that they're going, you know, for the jugular. There are others that actually want specific things from a Google, meaning they actually want to be able to show that they've, you know, settled for X, either dollars or something else. You have the DOJ uh, and everybody in Washington, and that's, but that's almost a different issue. There's a political element to that, of course, but, there, but, I, but I would like to think that there's actually uh, maybe a more merit-based version of what's going on uh, there, maybe. How do, you, how do you think about that whole stew? Right. I think they're complementary. The states are going to probe potentially a bunch of issues. And by the way, there are some states that have been looking at Google for quite some time now. Missouri is one of them. Before Josh Hawley became a senator, he was leading an antitrust investigation of Google within the state of Missouri. So those pieces are certainly still unfolding. And the feds have taken a much different approach. The Justice Department, for instance, had announced this broad review of big tech that said it was going to look into search, e-commerce, and advertising and so that pretty much matches up with Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so forth, even though they didn't mention those companies by name. So I think the feds would tell you that they're going to go where the facts lead them, uh, right. whether it's in the direction of digital advertising or something else. So there's just a lot of activity now. All of this rhetoric is finally leading to something among regulators, state and federal. Tony, thanks for your time. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. When we return, the CEO of Canopy Growth on the company's venture with Martha Stewart the future of cannabis-infused products, and much more. And Jane Wells is in Montana this morning, where fake meat is no laughing matter for the ranchers. Jane. <laughs> hey, Becky. Yeah, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods have had impossible momentum, and the beef industry is taking notice. Up next, live from Montana, ranchers fight back when Squawk returns with dinner. Farmer Johnson's daughters just pulled up in a Jeep. Can you customize the S&P 500 to meet your... I can find and fund my car From a Mini to a Jaguar Feel good car buying from findandfundmycar.com is the place where you can find quality used cars from trusted dealers rated by you and where you can fund your car with finance to fit your budget. It's feel good car buying all in one place. Carry on to find and fund my car. Tesco, we can pop our pasta in your Astra, our Red Leicester in your Fiesta, or our Mayo in your Mondeo. All you need to do is try, click, and collect. Just go to Tesco.com, order your shopping, then click and collect. With the minimum basket spend now only £25. And if you fancy something a little more exotic, we can even put our pad thai in your cash kai. Try, click, and collect at Tesco.com. Every little helps. Selected larger stores, booking charge may apply. See online for full terms and conditions. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And they'd have chained the back wheel. Would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. Did someone say winter sun? It's that time again. And this year at Jet2 Holidays, we're saying Cyprus. On this incredible island, you get it all. A choice of four and five star hotels. Amazing ancient ruins for culture packed days out. Hiking and cycling trails for active adventures. And plenty of blue flag beaches for soaking up that winter sun. Book Cyprus now with just a £60 deposit. Jet2 Holidays. Package holidays you can trust. Apra Natural Protected. Subject to availability and conditions. Casa Bacardi is back. Bringing a party with an unmissable lineup and tasty rum cocktails to London. With Bacardi. Bacardi's new Sound of Rum crew, featuring live sets from One Nation and P Money, MC in from Harry Panero, and loads more. The perfect recipe for an epic night out. Castle Bacardi at Box Park Croydon on September 14th. For more info and to get your tickets now, head to boxpark.co.uk. Do what moves you. Over 18s only. Drink aware for the facts. At the bank of Antandek, they're looking for a mascot. We need an icon. Something that says high fly into all our mortgage customers. Like a falcon. Or a stallion. Or even better, a parrot. Check it out. Meanwhile, at Santander, they're concentrating on helping customers find ways to take years off their mortgage with their overpayment calculator. See what's possible at Santander. All applications are subject to status and our lending criteria. Your home may be repossessed if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage. 
The beef industry is fighting to keep market share from uh, slipping to new plant-based substitutes. Jane Wells joins us now uh, from the front lines. Really? From the actual front lines of that battle, Jane. <laughs> And for some of them, it's the back line. But yeah, it's sort of a David and Goliath picture here because uh, Beyond Meat is going to have, what, maybe $240 million in revenues this year. Uh, whereas the beef, the cattle industry, the USD estimates the cattle herd has a market value of $67 billion. But Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger have such momentum and ranchers are taking notice and they have several beefs. Beef number one. A Beyond Meat CEO told me land use. He uses less than a tenth of the land necessary to provide the same amount of protein that cattle use. But Montana and Wyoming rancher Brett Crosby says all land is not created equal. 90% of the land that is grazed by cattle is has no other uh, no other productive use. Uh, have you tried a plant-based meat? I've tried them all, yes, I have. <laughs> what do you think? So I, I will say that uh, the last, as is, is the science improves, uh, those products are getting better. But uh, California cattle rancher Kevin Kester has a second beef. His industry is stringently regulated by the USDA, uh, whereas the plant-based products are more loosely regulated by the FDA. But if you have to cook a, a Beyond Meat burger or Impossible burger, if you can't eat it raw, if you have to refrigerate it just like meat, shouldn't it be regulated just like meat by the USDA? We want to make sure that the USDA has oversight of that because they do a really good job at uh, in safety inspections and we want a level playing field for all products regardless of where they come from. Okay, and finally the third beef, when do you call meat meat, okay? Especially the stuff that will soon be coming out of the lab maybe, which on a cellular level is just like meat. Who needs an animal? Well, 25 states, half the nation have introduced laws or resolutions about labeling saying you can't call it meat unless it comes off an animal. Of that 25, 13 have passed those laws and resolutions. Guys, including Missouri, where the law is now being challenged in co court by the makers of Tofurky. Back to you. Ooh, be careful, okay. be careful with that one, uh, Jane. Uh, I haven't, haven't had that. I've had uh, a turducken. That uh, doesn't count. That's real. <laughs> Same huh? thing. That's turkey, well, duck, and then chicken. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jane. Uh, uh, oh. all, right. Yeah, all right, Jane. Keep, keep doing, uh, you got to do some follow-ups on this. Uh, I, I think keep us uh, updated on this. I, I can't get enough of the, this story here. I really can't. You know what I mean? Uh, wait till the sun rises, guys. We are in some of the most beautiful country in America, and uh, we'll be up in the mountains here shortly later on for uh, Squawk Alley, I think. Okay. Okay. Jane, awesome. great to see you. I don't know what we're going to eat during the commercial Thanks. break, but that's a separate conversation. Coming up, uh, when we return, trimming the fat at Goldman Sachs, a new report out saying the bank is culling its upper ranks. We're going to tell you why after the break. And are you ready for some football? Tonight, the NFL is back on NBC. Catch the Packers and the Bears as the football season kicks off. Squat Box returns right after this. Buying from findandfundmycar.com is the place where you can find quality used cars from trusted dealers rated by you and where you can fund your car with finance to fit your budget. It's feel good car buying all in one place. At Tesco, we can pop our pasta in your Astra, our Red Leicester in your Fiesta, or our Mayo in your Mondeo. All you need to do is try Click and Collect. Just go to tesco.com, order your shopping, then click and collect. With the minimum basket spend now only £25. And if you fancy something a little more exotic, we can even put our pad thai in your cash kai. Try Click and Collect at tesco.com. Every little helps. Selected larger stores, booking charge may apply. See online for full terms and conditions. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And they'd have chained the bat wheel. It would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, 
I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. Did someone say winter sun? It's that time again. And this year at Jet2 Holidays, we're saying Cyprus. On this incredible island, you get it all. A choice of four- and five-star hotels, amazing ancient ruins for culture-packed days out, hiking and cycling trails for active adventures, and plenty of blue flag beaches for soaking up that winter sun. Book Cyprus now with just a £60 deposit. Jet 2 Holidays. Package holidays you can trust. Apronet or protected, subject to availability and conditions. Casa Bacardi is back, bringing a party with an unmissable lineup and tasty rum cocktails to London. With Bacardi new Sound of Rum crew, featuring live sets from One Nation and P Money, MC in from Harry Panero and loads more. The perfect recipe for an epic night out. Casa Bacardi at Box Park Croydon on September 14th. For more info and to get your tickets now, head to boxpark.co.uk. Do what moves you. Over 18s only. Drink aware for the facts. Welcome back to Squawk Box uh, this morning. Goldman Sachs reportedly looking to cull its partnership class under its new CEO, David Solomon. It's the focus of a new story in today's Wall Street Journal by reporter Liz Hoffman. And Liz joins us this morning. A lot of people buzzing uh, down uh, down to 200 West there, but also uh, around Wall Street um, more broadly. What, what does this really mean? Is this Because it, it's being positioned in a couple of different ways. One is that this is this sort of a culling, if you will, to sort of change the culture. The other is, this is just really to trim the fat and save some money because these are some very expensive people. It's a little bit of both of those things. Look, David's been in the seat about a year. He's putting his team in place, and that always comes with some turnover. Right. Partners are expensive. Yep. The pie is only so big. It's smaller than it used to be at Goldman these days, and so they have to make some changes. What kind of agit is this creating? I mean, talk about culture, at least in the immediate term. I assume there's some very unhappy people, and then I assume, by the way, there are probably some very happy people because there's been people at post-financial crisis who've been sitting in those seats much longer than historically they used to. Exactly right. I mean, Goldman is a place where very little changed for a long time. Lloyd Blankfein was in the job for 12 years. His senior team was very stable. And that was seen as an asset at the time, right? It really helped the firm get through a pretty stressful time post-crisis, fairly steady. But what that means is that, like nothing moves around underneath. And so you have all of this sort of pent-up energy. And when stuff starts to move, it moves pretty quickly, which is what you're seeing now. Okay, now the flip on that spin is that this is gonna, it's gonna help create, sort of recreate the partnership, this sort of old mystique. You remember, I remember we used to read these articles really in maybe the 90s and the aughts, all about the partnership, but part, a large part because the company was about to go public, or if you were a partner, that, that was something. Then, then those ranks expanded. How do you think that changes the, the dynamic now? There is something to that, right? The partnership is largely symbolic, right? right? The partner's capital is not in the firm. They went public. They have shareholder money. And so it's really this cultural token. And so it really, if you're going to have it at all, it has to mean a lot. So I, there really is something to that. It used to be when you made partner, your life changed overnight, and that's increasingly less true from a financial perspective, from a cultural perspective. We talked about it in the last hour with Bethany McLean. What do you think happens to this vintage, cl- this class of, of partners that's going to be leaving? Are we going to see this sort of Goldman diaspora end up, are you, are you going to start hiring some of these guys, or do they go, I mean, they used to go into politics or into Washington or other places. Where, where, does, where does this whole group go? Depends where they're coming from, right? You see traders leaving. There's fewer options for them than there used to be. Hedge funds are having a lot of trouble. Asset management's under a lot of pressure. Bankers, you know, this happened a little bit about 10 years ago when David Solomon was running investment banking. There was this crew of partners that left, and Goldman's view at the time was, you know what, we're Goldman, we'll be fine. And then those guys popped up at a lot of boutiques and started doing a lot of deals. So you will start to see it move around. In general, I think the sense is there are fewer options for Goldman partners than there used to be just because of the state of Wall Street these days. Who is the big winner from this? Meaning, are there... Are there David young, Solomon. No, no, but are there younger names that we haven't heard about yet that all of a sudden are going to come onto the scene that have been waiting for this moment? I think that's the hope, right? There's two things here. There's one way to look at it, which is the new sheriff in town kind of putting his people in the seats that he wants, people he can trust, consolidating a little bit of power. There are, I should say, some people who are looking around at the firm, which is undergoing a huge transformation, right. building this big Main Street bank, going big into money management. That's... I, that's not something that everyone wants to stick around for. It's pretty uncertain. So there's a little bit of push and a little bit of pull. But the idea certainly is that you have these young people for whom this can actually be like a, a very transformational opportunity they probably haven't had the chance right. to get into. 
Final words, Eric Ken, are you headhunting this morning? Listen, based I, on the story, I, if uh, I think if you ask Ken Mullis, are we hiring? Yes, we're always hiring, and I do right. think that these are we, very expensive people, though. I, I do think that if you, if you've seen the way we have hired, we've hired smartly and uh, always paying attention to the bottom line. And I do think the beneficiaries are, and as as you said, Liz, that the the, uh, the boutiques and the advisory firms have right. have been the beneficiary from a market share. I think it's been post crisis. Post crisis is when things really did change okay. uh, on Wall Street. Okay, uh, Liz, thank you. Are you supposed to say, "Hey, hey, Marty, Marty, call me, call me"? Right there. Okay, thanks. You don't, you don't like my butt jokes. All right, coming up, uh, the CEO of Canopy Growth. The audience uh, doesn't even understand yeah, what, what just happened. Yeah, there. joins us after. I think they understand all too well, really. And, and then later, taking on the Trump economy, how presidential hopeful and founder of Next Gen America founder Tom Steyer uh, joins us with his uh, economic plan for America. Squawk Boss will be right back. CrowdStrike Falcon. I can find and fund my car From a Mini to a Jaguar Feel good car buying from findandfundmycar.com is the place where you can find quality used cars from trusted dealers rated by you and where you can fund your car with finance to fit your budget. It's feel good car buying all in one place. This me and the Losers Club has officially begun. Tomorrow, I dream of you. It all ends. I craved you. In London. I missed you. <laughs> Don't miss the final chapter. We didn't stop it. We can't let it happen again. Don't miss the end of It. Huh? It, Chapter 2. <laughs> it's cinemas tomorrow. Book tickets from your desktop. Rated 15. At Tesco, we can pop our pasta in your Astra. Our Red Lester in your Fiesta. Or our mayo in your Mondeo. All you need to do is try click and collect. Just go to tesco.com, order your shopping, then click and collect. With the minimum basket spend now only £25. And if you fancy something a little more exotic, we can even put our pad thai in your cash kai. Try click and collect at tesco.com. Every little helps. Selected larger stores, booking charge may apply. See online for full terms and conditions. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And then the chain the bat will. Would have taken me much longer, especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. Did someone say winter sun? It's that time again. And this year at Jet2 Holidays, we're saying Cyprus. On this incredible island, you get it all. A choice of four and five star hotels, amazing ancient ruins for culture packed days out, hiking and cycling trails for active adventures, and plenty of blue flag beaches for soaking up that winter sun. Book Cyprus now with just a £60 deposit. Jet2 Holidays. Package holidays you can trust. Apronet or protected, subject to availability and conditions. Casa Bacardi is back, bringing a party with an unmissable lineup and tasty rum cocktails to London. With Bacardi. Bacardi's new Sound of Rum crew, featuring live sets from One Nation and P Money, MC in from Harry Panero, and loads more. The perfect recipe for an epic night out. Castle Bacardi at Box Park Croydon on September 14th. For more info and to get your tickets now, head to boxpark.co.uk. Do what moves you. Over 18s only. Drink aware for the facts. Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. Congress returning uh, from August recess with little progress on cannabis legislation. Joining us right now to discuss the marijuana market is Mark Zeckelin. He's the CEO of Canopy Growth. It's good to see you, Mark. Um, congratulations uh, on this new role. Uh, and, and we want to hear what's happened uh, since uh, Bruce Linden, who actually joined us recently, uh, what, what it's been like. But I want to start with this issue of what's happening in Washington right now when it comes to legislation on marijuana. Where are we and where do you think it's going this fall? Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm always hesitant to comment on, on politics, particularly American politics from, from Canada. But what we clearly see is that 
there are no major groups who are in opposition to some sort of states' rights legislation. So I think that can only be viewed as, as a very positive sign right now. Um, you know, we, uh, we recently had Scott Gottlieb on the program, and, you know, I know you, you're expanding the CBD, CBD products, and he basically said he thinks the CBD products should be illegal, or are illegal, frankly. What do you make of that? Well, I think the Farm Bill has, has clearly said otherwise, and, and today we're in a position where we're waiting for further guidance from the DEA, but, you know, in terms of legality, as, as far as any expert I can talk to says, you know, the CBD is is open for business and you know we as a company have major contracts with american farmers to produce cbd hemp we're launching american production sites with construction underway in california new york and illinois and we're building an american supply chain to ensure that we can have cbd sales in america this fiscal year right how much influence these days does Constellation have on your business, how it's operating, and since you've taken over? I, I mention this because Constellation, of course, is a major investor in the company. Uh, it is said that it expects a record loss of more than $50 million uh, in its current quarter because of the investment in the company. So Constellation, as, as, you, as you've said, has a major investment in, in our company and invested over $4 billion U.S. dollars um, to give us that ammunition to continue to do what we're doing. So we have a great relationship. And, you know, one, one good example, if we look at our Cannabis 2.0 beverages that we're building, you know, that is, that is a combination of Canopy's intellectual property to have uh, a, a good-tasting, formulated drink that, that is akin to a beverage alcohol experience with no hangover, no calories, uh, but the knowledge of how to actually take that IP and put it into a bottling plant and, and conduct market segmentation comes from you know, the expertise of, of Constellation. So this is a great example of, of two great companies working together. But, but in terms of the loss and in terms of the pressure on you now, I mean, how involved are they sort of on a day-to-day -day basis or, or in terms of influencing the day-to-day -day operations? So Constellation has a, has a number of people on our board, but that is that is the extent of it. From a, from a management perspective, you know we're continuing to do what we've always been doing. You know this is a moment where you know we have never been in a better position as Canopy. You know if you think about it, for the last five years we have been investing in intellectual property, major scaled capacity in Canada, and a team to execute on those things. And what excites me most. In Canada, we are on, believe it or not, month 70 of a construction program. And the exciting part is we have four months left in that program, which means we can start to shift in Canada from being builders to really being operators focused on asset utilization, efficiency, and while we have a, a, a operating mentality in Canada, we can now take all of that knowledge we've built as builders and right. deploy it into the U.S., which we're doing right now. Hey, Mark, I don't know if you can see it on the screen. We're showing uh, the last year's stock price, basically the stock over, over the last year. And as you, as you can see, there was a point at which it was actually close to $60 a share. We're now obviously $25 a share. You think investors are missing something here? What do you think is going on? Yeah, I think, you know, firstly, the entire cannabis sector is, is down as of late. And I think what's happening is there is a set of investors who are not seeing the Canadian market develop as quickly or, or as anticipated. And then on top of it, as, as you mentioned when you started, there's a lot of uncertainty still in the United States and globally. So you have that happening. But from a, a long-term investor perspective, you know, those investors have been through this before. The cannabis stocks are not for the faint of heart. They go up, they go down. But the question is, you know, which company do you want to be invested in that has an eye on the prize? And that prize is is a multi-hundred billion dollar global market for cannabis. Right. And in my view, Canopy is as best positioned as anyone to seize that. Um, Eric Canner is here. I have a political question for you. How quickly or not do you think you're going to see federal legalization of marijuana? Look, I think right now the, um, the issue of lack of bipartisanship is going to flow over into this. I think... Um, the comment that um, there is some kind of agreement on states' rights. I'm not so sure. I know on my side of the aisle there would be that uh, sort of directional trend. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm not so sure there's enough unity on the, even this issue. Right. And, and also, given the, and you mentioned Scott Gottlieb's position, yep. and given the uh, just um, opposition to, to cannabis in general, I'm not so sure this is an easy lift for Congress at all. Mark, final word? 
Yeah, I think you know what what gives me a lot of a lot of hope on that legalization point is just that um, you know we're really getting into the details of social justice and and American farmers, and and I think that is past the basic principle of hey, should cannabis be um, be you know something that that states have the right to uh, to to legalize? So I think it's a great thing, and again, as as Canopy, we are excited to be. In, in the United States, working with American farmers, working on production. Uh, Mark, it's uh, great to see you. Next time you're in New York, uh, please stop by the set. We'd love to see you. Your Thank you. or something? Uh, oh, you think there's like a delivery? Uh, I don't know. Uh, no comment. Uh, no comment. <laughs> okay. I'm waiting for the psychedelics to get uh, legalized, right? Uh, Microdosing? <laughs> That's well, next. Is that where are we? Uh, I thought that explained a lot. You know, I watched that. You're not. I watched that. I, I watched that town hall meeting last night, and I actually thought I dropped some acid. Right. I, I did. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. Oh, no, I, I, it was long. <laughs> when we come back, what the bond market is signaling for the month of September and the Fed meeting then. Also, a note for viewers: Vice President Mike Pence is going to be sitting down with Joe on stage at this year's Delivering Alpha. It's produced by CNBC and Institutional Investor. It's September 19th in New York. You can register to attend now at DeliveringAlpha.com. Squawk Box will be right back. I can find and fund my car From a Mini to a Jaguar Good car buying from findandfundmycar.com is the place where you can find quality used cars from trusted dealers rated by you and where you can fund your car with finance to fit your budget. It's feel good car buying all in one place. With rapid insurance on Vodafone business, we'll get a replacement phone to you within four hours. So if you should... Oh, no. Or even... Just get in touch and we'll... Your replacement phone, sir. Your phone replaced within four hours with our rapid insurance. Available on our new and limited data plans. The future is exciting. Ready? Vodafone Business. Max download, upload speed, apply to data. Coverage may vary. Unlimited and rapid terms at vodafone.co.uk slash terms. This one shouldn't take long. Of course, if it had a cover, I might not be bothered. Can't see what's under there. And then they'd have chained the bat wheel. It would have taken me much longer. Especially if the chain's off the ground. Makes it harder to cut. This one doesn't even have a lock on the front. So, in the time I've been talking to you, I've nicked it. Over 9,000 scooters and motorbikes were stolen in London last year. Lock your bike, chain the rear wheel, and cover it to make it harder to steal. Lock, chain, cover. The Met Police. Did someone say winter sun? It's that time again. And this year at Jet2 Holidays, we're saying Cyprus. On this incredible island, you get it all. A choice of four- and five-star hotels, amazing ancient ruins for culture-packed days out, hiking and cycling trails for active adventures, and plenty of blue flag beaches for soaking up that winter sun. Book Cyprus now with just a £60 deposit. Jet 2 Holidays. Package holidays you can trust. Apron at all protected, subject to availability and conditions. Casa Bacardi is back, bringing a party with an unmissable lineup and tasty rum cocktails to London. With Bacardi Bacardi's new Sound of Rum crew, featuring live sets from One Asin and P Money, MC in from Harry Panero, and loads more. The perfect recipe for an epic night out. Castle Bacardi at Box Park Croydon on September 14th. For more info and to get your tickets now, head to boxpark.co.uk. Do what moves you. Over 18s only. Drink aware for the facts. Welcome back to Squad Box this morning. Investors struggling to game out the Fed's next move amid a sea of Fed speak. And Steve Leisman, Leisman joins us uh, to try to game it out for us. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Members of the Fed speaking their mind and not necessarily all of the same mind. I'm going to divide out all the Fed speak into three different buckets here. One, some are saying the economy doesn't warrant a cut yet. Others are saying they're monitoring the data and they look kind of ready, ready or leaning to act here. And then there's the those saying need easing now and they're doing so, I would say, with an exclamation point. Here's three examples. Uh, Eric Rosengren, Boston Fed president, he dissented last time, says if growth is near 2%, which is his forecast, and the potential, he doesn't nearly... He doesn't see nearly as much of a need for taking immediate policy action. Then there's John Williams, uh, New York Fed president. He says he's carefully monitoring this nuanced picture and remains vigilant to act as appropriate. That is code for I'm going to act. 
And then uh, Bullard, you know Jim, uh, he, St. Louis Fed president, he says, I would respect the market signal better in my mind to go ahead and get realigned right now, calling for 50, which is a very uh, minor uh, probability right now in the markets. Uh, Powell has the votes to cut if he wants to, a quarter point in September. Probably, again, with two dissents. A lot depends on the jobs number. We get the ADP at 8.15. We got uh, BLS tomorrow. And then Powell in the afternoon. We'll speak at Switzerland. We have all that going for us, uh, which is nice. As opposed to what, Joe? You got something else going on? Uh, there's always what do you things got? going what on. But, but but nothing is good, as good as the I got, I got AP. I got BLS. I got jobs. Don't we have a I got Friday? productivity yeah. and, and claims. You, what do you got? You got nothing. Isn't it uh, Unemployment Friday? It's, un it's, it's, it's Employment, employment Friday. Friday. In this, uh, currently. The that, other that administration, would be, that would you called it Unemployment Friday. That's <laughs> that would what you the other it. administration. All right, yeah. now. Uh, it was more as Tom Thinky or Think. Think? Think. Lose the E, Tom. No, that's what separates me from Larry. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you want to be... Okay. Well, uh, Larry's great. Anyway, Chairman and CEO of Bearings, a $325 billion uh, global asset manager that invests across public and private markets. Tom also runs uh, one of the largest high-yield and private debt uh, teams in uh, the industry. And did you ever think you'd wake up every morning and, and globally see the situation we have? And, and were you prepared for it? Are you Were you set up right? For, for this well, I think we were set up right uh, over the years because we've really never been one that uh, bets on rates and makes that move a sort of a top-down investor. We're more a fundamental bottoms-up credit investor. So we're always looking at companies and, and, and finding value from the bottoms up, aware of these issues like where we are in rates. Uh, but you, you know, it's extraordinary times. We've, we've Is it? It's, well, Maybe the other things were extraordinary. Well, they were all extraordinary. But, right. But, uh, but what's the norm? What, and what, and what, what, is, what is norm? Maybe we were too high for a while, weren't we, Leesman? Uh, we, we, we might have been. We, um, you could say that relative to other countries, we were too high relative to maybe the, maybe the underlying for Maybe the rate. 70s put us in this weird 19.5% interest rate environment yeah. that we thought was normal, and we thought 7 was low, and maybe it was always high. Yeah, maybe. Uh, t Tom, uh, R Rosengren yesterday said the lack of the, the low spreads on high yield is an indication that the economy is not as bad as people think. That is one interpretation. Right. The other interpretation is rates are so low, people are reaching for yield, and they'll take any 10th or 20th or 30 basis points that they can get. What's the answer for why the spreads on high yield, which should be so much higher... Th those aren't mutually exclusive. I they're not. Think. They're right. not, but but I just think it's, it's what's is it is it reaching for yield, or is it a, an assessment that the credit is good and the economy is not in bad shape? Our view is is a little bit in the middle, and what I would say by that is there's definitely a lot of capital in the system or a, a lot of liquidity to the markets these days, and certainly when this spreads wide now, you see a floor come in in terms of buyers like ourselves that will buy value. Uh, that said, you know, we think there is still overall a strong tone to the, con uh, to the economy, moderately strong, but we're very worried about certain sectors. And I think the default rate being so low, that's going to move up you know, more when you see certain sectors like retail, which we've seen recently, continue to have issues because of the competition from e-commerce. And, and, and so it's a mixed... It's sort of the middle of the road. It's not pre, it's not 06, where things were so, so tight and the system was so levered. It's a lot more moderate. So I know you're, you're, you're bottoms up, but, but can we just do a, 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 do you have a recession call? Uh, is it, have you moved it from 35 to 36 or it, it, over the next 12 our, to 18 months? Our view is a recession is eventually likely in the next couple of years if, if we see things kind of continue to pan out. So you don't have an actual trailer. number like some firms where they're, no. they're, they go from 30 to 40, which is still... No, I don't do a number. It's just, it I used to be 70% we won't, now it's 60% we won't. It's all useless, it, but, they, it's, but they seem to, to like to do that for some it, reason. Anyway. If, you, if you, well, you know, that's why the economists do it. CEOs just go in there and say, how am I going to run my business But what about this? your book? Does your book send a signal if you look at the high yield number? If you were saying, mm -hmm. okay, I'm looking at my book for a signal here from recession, what happens to the high yield? What happens to the fixed income market? before other than this inversion? You're, you're really not... If you look at... The, with high yield, we really start looking at the weakness 